Father in heaven, we are grateful to be here this morning. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending your son that we might have so many reasons to sing. We are redeemed. We've been renewed and restored because of this glorious grace. And that we were once part of this song where we were once bound up, but your son Jesus has set us free. We were once without hope. And then your son came into our lives. And thank you, Jesus, for saving us. Thank you for giving us joy. We ask today, Jesus, that you would give us ears to hear what, what you would say in your word. We ask that you would guide and direct our, our hearts and our minds, the meditations. That your word would plant itself well within us today. You know where we've been this week, and you know some have had a, a rough go, Jesus, and they made their way to church, maybe even some drawn this morning, just to get into your presence, just to be with the, the people of God, just to bring their, their issues before you this morning, because they know that you are the only one that's the savior of our souls the solution to all of our problems. So I pray today, Jesus, that those that need healing, that you would heal. Those that need some joy, that their cup would run over. Those that need some peace, that you would calm the, the storms in their lives, Jesus. Those that need jobs and those that just don't see a way out, that they would look to you today. Thank you, Jesus, for being high and exalted. Your word says in 1 Chronicles 29, 11, David says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness of the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head over all. How we need to remind ourselves that yours is the greatness. That everything about you, Jesus, is wonderful. So keep drawing us closer and closer to you, Jesus. We're excited about what you are going to do today. We love you. We need you. Spirit of God, come and have your way in, in this place today. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. And the church said, amen and amen, amen. Thank you, Brother Tony, Sister Karen. I have known Tony and his wife for many, many years, and they are dear, uh, dear friends of mine. So I'm glad they were able to come out this morning and spend some time with us. How's everybody doing? Blessed and good. We all made it through the snow, right? It's like, oh my goodness, Jesus, bring on the summer. I'm waiting patiently for it. There's a sister out there that's walking around without a jacket. I'm going, whoo, blessings to you. It's like, yeah, I need to, I need to left my beanie at home. Hey, well, if you are new to Calvary Chapel Beaumont, my name is Pastor Henry. I'm one of uh, the pastors here, and uh, if you are new, outside uh, these doors is a little gazebo, a little tent, and we have a little welcome table. We'd love to welcome you. There's a little bag there and a little gift in there, and we just want to say thank you, and make sure you fill out the card that's in there. We like to write everyone a letter just welcoming them to Calvary Chapel Beaumont. And those of you that are tuning in online, thank you so much for hanging out with us. If you're not in the area, let us know where you're tuning in from. We always want to know where people are tuning in from. We've got a wonderful message from a, a sister out of town uh, earlier this week. So thank you so much for tuning in. We love you. Jesus loves you. Hey, we'll make your way to Mark chapter 10. The only announcement we have is, I believe, next week we have our foundations class starting up. So if you are new to following Jesus or you would just like to brush up on what does it mean to follow Jesus, what does it mean to be a Christian, what's salvation, who is Jesus, who is the Holy Spirit, oh, who's God the Father, the foundations class meets at 8 o'clock uh, on Sunday mornings, and it's a wonderful opportunity to even ask some questions about the Christian faith. So if that is you, you want to make sure you tune in to that. I believe it'll start next Sunday. The title of today's message is A Lesson to Remember. A Lesson to Remember. If I could ask it a question to you like this, are you learning, family? Are you learning, are you growing? Or maybe for some of you, uh, what has God been, been teaching you? I can say it through the last two and a half years. Uh, we've all been learning quite a, a great deal about ourselves, about life. 
And my hopes are is there are times in, in life where it does become a little difficult. And if, if we're not careful, our, this time uh, move fast. Lord, it, it's painful. Um, I don't understand what you're doing. So let's just fast forward this whole clock thing, Jesus. But family, in, in, in doing so, we may miss a lesson or two that God wants to teach us. And as all of us know that have lived life a little bit, when we fail to learn a lesson, we were going to what? Repeat it again. So wherever the Lord has you, it may be painful. Uh, you may feel disillusioned. But the prayer should be, Jesus, I want to, I want to learn my lesson and not in a negative way, but Jesus, I want to I see you in this lesson. Jesus, I want to I find you in, in, in what you're trying to, to teach me. I don't want to just uh, go in and out of trials and tribulations and difficult times without finding you, without finding the lesson that you have for me. Today in our text, Jesus is headed to uh, Jerusalem. He's with his disciples and a few others are following him. And Jesus uh, has a lot to pack into uh, a couple of days because in our text, Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. The triumphal entry we're going to uh, learn about in, in two weeks. That's, that's, a, that's seven days. Jesus is going to be crucified. So he has just a little bit more time with his disciples and he is going to continue to teach them. So when you get to Mark chapter 10 at verse 32, give us an amen. amen. Good job, everybody. Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 32, says this. It says, now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Quote, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. And the church said, Amen. Amen. So Jesus is going up on the road to Jerusalem. The scripture says that uh, Jesus was going before them. You remember when we were little kids and we didn't want to do something, we would. Jesus knew what was going to happen to him at Jerusalem. The word of God says he is going before them. He's not saying, hey, I'll, I'll meet you there. We'll eventually get there. No, Jesus is going before them. Jesus is leading them, knowing what is going to happen to him in Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says this, now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, it says that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. That Jesus purposed, he's leading the way to Jerusalem. And the disciples are amazed. They're going, we know in Jerusalem things are going to be difficult. Jesus has been having run-ins with the religious uh, scribes and Pharisees. And their headquarters is in Jerusalem. So Jesus is leading them to a place of, of some suffering. And the Bible says, and as they followed, they were afraid. Now, as they, this, this word they isn't speaking of the 12 uh, apostles or disciples, but the other crowd that was following Jesus, most likely other followers of Jesus. One commentator says it like this. The word fearful or afraid is basically a word that refers to a kind of fear that is a baffling kind of fear. Uh, there was some confusion with them. They're still sort of caught up in this messianic idea of Judaism that Jesus is going to set up his kingdom and yet they've heard about the things that he said regarding his death. Their hope is very low and they're baffled, they're confused. And it's that kind of fear of why is he doing this? Why is he walking into this deadly danger? The scripture then goes on and Jesus says that, the Bible says that he took the 12 aside again 
and began to tell them the things that would happen. This is the third time that Jesus is telling them about what is going to happen in Jerusalem. He didn't tell them just once, not just twice, but three times. And anybody else like that where God has to tell us? (laughs) He took them aside again. What's so beautiful, family, is that Jesus wants them to know what's going to happen. He he doesn't want them to to be in the dark. He doesn't want them to be disillusioned about the future. So he tells them once again, what's going to happen. Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. The son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. They will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. If you are a note taker this morning, our first point is remember, I will rise again. Remember, I will rise again. These words that Jesus has has given, they're they're, they're painful words. They're they're very descriptive words. He says that he's going to be betrayed. Does anybody know who was in the audience hearing this when Jesus said that? Judas was in the audience. Now, we would think that Judas would say, huh. Let me file that one away somewhere back in the, in the back. So how would Jesus know all of these things were going to happen? Two reasons. The first one is Jesus is God and he knows all things. The second reason is Jesus knows the Old Testament prophecies. Let me give you just a couple of these prophecies. Psalm 41 speaks of Jesus' betrayal. It says, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Zechariah 12 speaks of the crucifixion. It says, then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Psalm 22 was written 1044 BC. Listen to what it says. It says, my God, my God, Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. So Psalm 22 speaks of Jesus' suffering. Let me give you one more. Psalm 16 speaks of Jesus' resurrection. It says, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now, these, these, these words here that, that Jesus is describing, he's going to be betrayed. And, and think about this. Jews hated Gentiles. So for Jews to hand over one of their own to the Gentiles, you knew that there was this great hatred. You see, the Jews uh, were, they didn't have the authority to hand over someone to die. In John chapter 18, when they took Jesus to Pilate, Pilate said, hey, you take Jesus and judge him according to your law. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. So Jesus is letting his disciples know what is going to happen when they come to Jerusalem. But he says in the third day, I'm going to rise again. So as your faith fails, don't forget the third day I'm going to rise again. As, as things in your life uh, uh, seem dark, like you, like you don't know where to go and you don't know where to turn to, remember, I'm going to rise again. After all of you forsake me, remember, I'm going to rise again. So afterwards, after Jesus' resurrection, the disciples are going to connect all these dots. But right now, can you imagine Jesus saying, hey, we're going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. I'm going to be scourged. And they knew what that meant. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'll be handed over. They're going to kill me, but I'm going to rise again. So I wonder if that Jesus was talking, they were just going, what does any of that mean? But then you and I can look back and say, this is what Jesus went through to save you and me. Service is over. Like that's it, right? (laughs) Now think about this. Betrayal, condemned to death, mocked, scourged, spit on. They're going to kill him. He still went to Jerusalem. If you and I knew that 
one of us would do any of this to us, I'm like, for them? Are you kidding me? Think about this. Think about this. Think about this. Jesus dying for us. I know we're in church and we're like holy now, right? <laughs> the, the worst of us, the, the worst parts of us, Jesus went to the cross, endured its shame for people like you and me. That's why we love us some Jesus, right? That, 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 to be scourged and beaten. Read Isaiah 50. Isaiah 55, read, read it, read it, read it. You, you read it that, 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 that he was, that he was uh, marred more than, than any, than any, than any uh, uh, human. Talks about by his, by his stripes that, 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 that we were, that we are healed. When we, when we read the scriptures, we, we read about the, the greatness of, of Jesus, of what he has done. And, and my hopes are that we read the scriptures and we go, Jesus, how, how great are you? Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. As it were, we hid our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. We're going, how, how great is Jesus? Think of it like this, that you and I are the objects of God's love. When we, when we woke up this morning, we saw this big ball of light in the sky, right? That's called the sun, the S-U-N. As powerful as the S-U-N is, it's not the object of Jesus' love. Isn't that crazy, right? As, as magnificent, as, as beautiful, as, as powerful and great as the, the sun is, S-U-N. What the Bible say? What is man that, that you are mindful of him? That, that yet you and I are the objects of, of Jesus' love. It's just simply, simply beautiful. They're going to scourge him and spit on him. He's going to die. But our story doesn't end at a grave, doesn't end at some dark tomb. That, I've been to Jerusalem and I've, I've looked into the, 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 the tomb and there ain't nobody there. Amen. It's empty. They said, hey, come on in. We're like, I mean, I knew there was nobody in there, right? I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Bible's right. Jesus isn't in there. Little picture. How wonderful is it? And I, I, I mention these things to you because Sometimes we, like the disciples, forget that Jesus is high and lifted up and exalted, that Jesus isn't dead, he's not in some tomb, that he's not aloof from our issues and our problems. We need to be reminded that Jesus has risen from the dead, that our, our Savior is alive. The Bible says that even right now that he's making intercession for you and me. Uh, for those of you that are new to following Jesus, that means he's, he's praying for you and me. And I'm not sure about you, but I would love to hear Jesus praying for me. <laughs> Jesus, say it again. One more time, Jesus. Oh, man, that's so good. Can you imagine Jesus praying for you? I wonder what he'd be praying for you right now. Maybe that your faith not fail. That you would remember that he is risen. That you would remember that one day he's coming back for you and for me. How glorious is this? So on the heels of Jesus telling his his disciples, what's going to happen in Jerusalem, the scourging, uh, the, the betrayal, the, the, uh, all this emotional pain that's going to happen. Listen to how his disciples responded. In verse 35, it says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they came to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, you're thinking, did, did we not just have a quick meeting, right? Going to Jerusalem, going to be handed over to the Gentiles, betrayed, mocked, scourged, spit on. They're going to kill me. I'm going to die. Then here comes James and John. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Our next point this morning is we want to be your main guys. We want to be your main guys. Guys, now family, 
What I love about the disciples and I love about the Bible is that it's just real. <laughs> now, sometimes we're like this, just like the same thing. <laughs> Jesus lays out what's going to happen. It's, it's, it's painful. It's, it's descriptive. And then here we come. Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask. What was their desire? Jesus, okay, you're, you're going to go away soon. Jesus, give us a great love for your people. Jesus, make us people of prayer. Jesus, fill us with the, this coming spirit. Uh, Jesus, uh, help us to be more like you. Nope, that was not their prayer. Verse 36, and uh, Jesus said to them, well, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. You see, the disciples believe that Jesus is going to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. So they're going, there's going to be some open positions. <laughs> so let me strike while the iron's hot. So Jesus, if you're setting up your kingdom, um, Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, James and John brought their mother. They brought their mother to ask. Now you're going, Jesus. I guess, I guess if you spend three and a half years with Jesus, you'd be thinking that some of it would just would be rubbing off, right? That, that if, you're, if you're, you know, bumping elbows with Jesus, you know, you're, you're, you're hearing the greatest sermons, you're, you're walking with him, you're seeing all these great miracles, you would think a little something, something would, would, would rub off. But here they're going, hey, we want to sit on your left and on your right in your kingdom. But Jesus said to them, well, do you know what you ask? Are you, are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, we are able Mm -mm. So Jesus said to them, uh, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink and with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it is prepared. So the cup and, and baptism, this speaks of, of suffering. We know that the cup that Jesus is, is speaking of uh, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, God the Father was going to pour out his wrath on his son, Jesus. That's why in Matthew 26, verse 39, the Bible says that Jesus went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this is possible, let this cup pass from me. He says, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. This, this, this cup of, of the, the, the fury of God the Father, Jesus was going to have to drink. Now, this, this cup and this baptism also speaks of, of persecution. It speaks of, uh, it speaks of a, a, a very uh, intense time of, of suffering. And now what's interesting is James here in our text he would be the first uh, apostle to die. He would be beheaded for his faith. Uh, John here in our text, he would be boiled in oil, and then he would be um, exiled to the Isle of Patmos where, we, where he penned the book of Revelation. So Jesus was saying, yes, you will indeed drink this cup and you will indeed be baptized. They didn't know it then, but Jesus says, yeah, in your future, you will indeed be able to drink this cup. One commentator says it like this, quote, are you really able to go all the way under and suffer? To be, as it were, drowned in persecution and ultimately martyrdom? This is strong language. Can you literally drink it all in and be submerged in it? Because that's what you're really asking. Because if you want the glory, the glory is the reward correspondent to the suffering. Sometimes we as followers of Jesus, we want the glory, but not the suffering. Um, how do you say it? We want, we want a testimony without having a test. So the disciples are going, hey, 
We want to sit here and sit here. Jesus says, there's going to be a great amount of suffering that you are going to have to go through. Can you do it? They're like, yes, we can. <laughs> yes. Yes, we can. Jesus said, in the near future, you will indeed suffer. And family, if we're not careful, we will create this, this kind of Christianity uh, where where there's no suffering, where, 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 where God's plan for our lives is devoid of, of suffering, that's called heaven, right? That's not called Beaumont, Banning, or Cherry Valley, or Calamesa. That, that's called heaven. You and I are going to suffer. And if we're, and if we're doing it biblically right, we're going to suffer a lot. We're going to, we're going to as we learned last week, we're going to, we're going to, give everything away. We're going to follow Jesus. We're going, to, we're going to live a life that's focused on the gospel. We're going to say no to self and follow Jesus. If, if we're following Jesus rightly, there, there should be, there must be some type of discomfort as you and I follow Jesus. And I know that you're like, oh, hey, welcome to Calvary Chapel Walmart, right? You're like, right. <laughs> lift us up this morning. There must be some, some, some type of, if we're following Jesus, if Jesus went through it, you and I are going to go through something. I mean, I mean, if we get to heaven and we're unscathed, I'm not sure if we did it right. Does that make sense? Because we're going to be in the presence of like Moses, Job, and Joshua, Gideon. Read Hebrews chapter 11, all the great things that they did. It says, uh, Hebrews 11, it says, uh, uh, some had trials of, of scourgings and mockings. They, 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 they dwelt in caves and the writer of Hebrews said, the world was not worthy of them. They weren't trying to fit in. The world was not worthy of them. Uh, here in our text, what we, what we see here is just, it's just this, this pride spilling out of these disciples. They've been with Jesus for, for three and a half years, and, and, and there's still a bunch of pride. Let me give you a few scriptures regarding pride, what the Bible says. Proverbs 16, it says, everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 6, it says, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an, are an abomination to him. What's number one on the list? Proud. We, we spend so much time going, well, God hates this. He really hates that. This is the ultimate. When was the last time we say, you know that God hates pride? You ever watch the Animal Planet Channel? You ever watch uh, when uh, some of the lions go hunting? They, create, they crouch down in the, in the brush. They come up once in a while, they go like this. And they go back down. They're just waiting for, for that little gazelle to come by. And all of a sudden, they jump up and the race is on. Our pride is sometimes like that, where it's so subtle. It's just, and if we're to be honest, sometimes we don't even, we don't even recognize that, that, we're, that we're saying something that just sounds utterly nauseating, right? As we're, as, we're like, as we're like boasting about our greatness, it's like slowly rising and slowly rising. And we think, we start our, we start our sentences with something like this, uh, you know, in my humble opinion. <laughs> like, who are you, Right? In all humility, I, I'm the most humble person you'll ever meet. Like stuff like that, right? Jesus, help us. When was the last time that, that somebody said, hey, that smelled a little, a little prideful? Because we, we have our eyes on these, what we would call big sins. But not on, on, on what we would call pequeño. Small, small pride. Jesus, the, the scripture says that the Lord hates pride. Listen to Psalm 73, verse 6. It says, therefore, pride serves as their necklace. I see some of you ladies have a necklace on this morning. What if that's the pride? They just, they wear it around their neck. Jesus, help us in this area, in this area of, of pride. So how does Jesus respond to this request? He says, hey, to sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to give, but it's for those whom it is prepared. Listen to verse 41. And when the ten heard it, they began 
to be greatly displeased with James and John. Why didn't James and John come to Jesus and say, Jesus, we want you to give us whatever we ask. Bless my brothers. Bless my, my brothers. Uh, draw them, them, them closer to you. Uh, 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 keep them close, Jesus. Oh, lift them up. But instead of blessing my brothers, Jesus, we want to we wanna be your, your main guys to, to sit on your right hand and to your left. So as the 10 heard it and were greatly displeased with James and John, listen to what Jesus does in verse 42. But Jesus called them to himself. You see, that's the solution, coming closer to Jesus. You're having all of these issues, let's everybody come closer to Jesus. Jesus called them to himself. Everybody, you, you 12, get over here. We need to talk once again. Uh, once again, we need, to, we need to talk. And what did Jesus say? And he said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles, they lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Our next point is the world's way. The world's way is to lord over, and I'm sure some of us have had a boss or two that was just a little too much on the power, right? <laughs> just a little like, hey, I'm just coming to work. You know, hey, I'm not like your mule, right? Just coming for a paycheck. But we know that absolute power corrupts what? Absolutely. So, so Jesus is saying, this is how the Gentiles lord over people. That's not how, that's not kingdom stuff. This is what Gentiles do. This is the, this is the, the world's way to exercise authority over someone, but this is not the, the Jesus way. Our world system family is climb over as many people as as you can to go for yours, get yours. Uh, you need to strike while the iron is hot. We need to, you need to let people know your skills. You need to throw it all out there. Whatever happened to Jesus, I'm just going to humble myself before you and you're going to exalt me in due time. Thank you for that one amen. You guys go, well, we gotta, you got you to let your skills and talents be known. Show up to work on time, take a 30-minute lunch, and then come back to work, right? Maybe someone will see that and say, man, they're a little different than the rest of the workers that we have. That's the Lord going, let me show that flashlight on. Let, 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 them, let them see me in you. And then your managers are going to go, hey, I've been, I've been watching you lately. Man, you're on time, helping out everybody else. You're not taking credit for other people's stuff. You know what? We, we may have an open position real soon, and you know what? Keeping you in mind. You're not like pimping out your, all, all, your, all your, uh, like your giftings and abilities. No, you're just simply serving Jesus while you're at work. And Jesus is the one that's going to exalt you in due time. Listen to what 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. And you ladies will be in 1 John really soon. It's going to be a phenomenal study. 1 John 2, 16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and what? The pride of life is not from what? The Father, but it's from where? It is from the world. The Bridgeway Bible Commentary says it like this. In the kingdoms of the world, people compete with each other to achieve power. But in the kingdom of God, true greatness comes from humble and willing service. I love that. Humble and willing service. Well, verse 43 and 45, it says, yet it shall not be among you. Jesus says, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Our second point this morning is remember to, to serve. Jesus says, this shall not be so uh, among you. He's still correcting. He's, he's still teaching. He's saying if you desire to be great among your brethren, then you need to, you need to serve them. Um, remember when we were, we were growing up and if you have older siblings, 
you know they bossed you around a, a little much. That you would eventually turn around and say, hey, you're not the boss of me. So what we're saying is, I don't like being treated the way that you are treating me. And you and I have carried that same uh, mindset into our adulthood. So when someone treats us like we are less than, we're offended. But what if Jesus says that's, that's being a servant? Be quiet now, huh? What if Jesus says, you need to live there. You need to live there where people, um, that you're okay with people thinking less of you. Because the greatest among you will be the, the servant. And last I checked, if you're a servant, you really don't have too much say in the matter. I need you to go there. I need you to go do that. I need you to go pull some weeds. I need you to go, to go change the little, little styrofoam things in the, in the urinals. I need you to go scrape up the gum. I need you to go pick up the cigarette butts in the parking lot. I need you to go, to go clean the mirrors in the bathroom. Psh, I own my own company. I have people come to my house to do stuff like that. Maybe Jesus says, I know, that's why you need to start the bathrooms. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Go, go change the breath mints in the urinals, right? Go, go, go change those. But there's something in us that says, I'm above that. I don't do stuff. I hire people to do stuff like that. But yet we call ourselves, we're, we're servants of, of Jesus. He that is greatest among you must be the servant. You and I are going to leave this place and we're probably going to go to eat. Someone's going to come to our table and say, what can I do for you? I want this, but I don't want it like this. I want this and put it on the side. I want this, but cook it like this. Oh, it's, it, it, it's too done. It's too pink. It's too runny. It's too this. It's too that. Jesus, I'm here to serve you, right? That, that, that's like our mindset. But Jesus here clearly tells the disciples, if you want to be great, it says, whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. James and John, you, you want to sit here and sit here? Go serve your brothers. Go, go serve your brothers. Go, go wash their feet. Uh, go prepare their meals. And there, there's something, something about, um, there, there's just that, this pride in us that says, don't treat me like you're better than me. Like, Maybe this all goes to, we don't know who we are in Christ. We're going to get into Ephesians real, real soon. That, that our identity is in Christ, that how someone treats us isn't the truth, right? Say whatever you want to say. Treat us however you want to treat us. What does Jesus think about me, right? We just read that Jesus is, is going to Jerusalem to be betrayed, to be scourged. They're going to kill him and he's going to rise again. Why? to save our souls. So does it really matter if somebody treats us, treats us bad? No, it may, it may hurt a little bit. We talked a few months ago that, you know, when you go to a restaurant and uh, your, your name is on the wait list and you, you see somebody going before you, you get a little indignant. Is, is it just me? Okay, I'll, I'll hug myself. Because Jesus is still working out the, the, the pride. I'm like, hey, we were here before them. I'm like, settle down, Pastor Man, right? We, we were here before them. We want, we want, you know, equity. We want justice. Maybe Jesus is saying, no, you need to eat some more of this. You just sit down and just, it, everything is going to work out fine. You and I have problems not being first. We have problems when people treat us like we are less than them. Apparently, here in the scriptures, Jesus is letting us know that if you desire to be great, you shall be your servant. He even goes on further than that in verse 44. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be what? But he says you shall be slave. Uh-oh, there's the S word there, right? <laughs> slave of all. Are we, are we there yet, family? 
somebody treats us like, a, like we're their slave or something? For some, that, that's, that's a bit much to grasp, that, I, that we would be treated in such a, such a way where somebody would tell us what to do, tell us where to go, and we would, we would have to do it. Jesus is telling his, his disciples that you would be slave of all. Jesus says in Mark 9, 35, he called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant, servant of all. Who is our example of this? Is Jesus. Think about this. The eternal son of God that spoke the universe leapt into existence, washed his disciples' feet. And we've all seen feet, right? <laughs> Can you see that? God, a very God. Do you know who, who, who washed the, the, the feet of someone when you came into someone's house? The servant. The servant. You come into someone's house, biblical times, they had a servant. Jesus, the eternal son of God, washing Judas's. Jesus is our example. So when we, when we read our Bibles, we can't say, well, I'm going to do that. Mm, that's too hard. I'm not going to do that. Ooh, let me go to the Psalms. Yeah, I can find some <laughs> uplifting stuff. Yeah, the Lord is my shepherd. He's going to guide me. Then we get to the New Testament. Jesus says, no, be the slave. We're like, oh, I, think I, I think I love living in the Psalms. Maybe it's a little easier for us. Jesus lastly says in verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That our example is Jesus. He, 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 he came to, to serve and to give his life as a ransom. What do we do with that, family? That, that if we're followers of Jesus, we must follow his example so if I were to ask you, how was your, your service this morning? Are, are you serving one another? That's why it's, it's important to, 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 to come to church, to, to gather with the saints, to, to, to sing and, and to worship and to serve and to serve and to serve and to, ser to serve one another. Now, what, what's beautiful is that most of you don't know the, uh, the, 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 the sister that that came here at Old Dark 30 and, and made the coffee and, and brought some donuts. You don't know who vacuumed up the floor, who waxed on and waxed off the, 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 the windows in the, in, in the bathroom. Someone set up the gazebo outside and it's what, negative 35 degrees outside. <laughs> Someone set the chairs up and the TV up. So people next service are going to be blessed by uh, an outside gazebo and some chairs being set up, the nursery being set up, the toys being all cleaned up. Why? Because... People are, are, are serving, so church has to be more. Has, church has to be about more than just you and, 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 and our comforts. It's got to be about service, serving one another, that if we're, if we're truly going to follow Jesus, let's, let's truly follow him. So if you're not serving after church is over, say, you know, next week I want to be an usher. Go online and fill up the ministry applications to make sure, you know, you're not crazy at all, but fill it all out and, and we'll contact you and we'll, 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 we'll place you in a, in a place where you can be blessed and, and, and bless others and uh, last week, two people gave their lives to Jesus. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? And you know what? We all play a role in it. Somebody had to open the door. Somebody had to say, hey, sit here. Back there, uh, uh, Carlos is, uh, is doing the sound, and, and Craig is doing the, 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 the live stream, and, and somebody's putting the words up on the screen, and some of you are saying hi to people. Then it comes to the end of the message, and somebody says, yeah. I think, I, I think I've heard Jesus today. I want to give my life to him. All because, obviously, the greatness of Jesus, but we're to serve one another. We don't know what kind of, what kind of week people have had. We don't know what, what, what's going on in people's lives, but they, they come to church, and how beautiful is it as you and I serve one another because that's what Jesus did. So Jesus says, if you want to be great, 
You're going to be the slave of all. So most likely this week, you and I will have an opportunity to learn this. When you leave here, somebody may treat you less than what you want them to treat you as. And when it happens, just go. (laughs) I learned about this in church right now. How quick is God? So we work, we're, gonna, we're not going to be all offended. We're going to say, thank you, Lord, for teaching me that it's not about me, that I'm just here to serve. I'm just here to serve you. Jesus, help us. We have a, a few take-home uh, points for you. The first one is uh, spend some quiet time meditating on what Jesus has has done to save you. Uh, take some time out this week and just, just get alone somewhere and just, just remember that the cross of Christ, that, that you and I would, would, would hide ourselves be, behind the cross of Christ, that we would remember that for Jesus to save you and I, he had to die. He had to be forsaken for people like you and me. It was not like, oh, this will be an easy thing, saving them. No. Saving us, Jesus had to die. I know we, we hear that a lot, and, and maybe it's become white noise to, uh, to some of you. We need to pray for the Holy Spirit to, to reveal this to us, that there was no other way to save us but the cross of Christ. And God forbid that we would ever boast but in Jesus. I'm always talking to our, 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 our staff about humility, about that as the Lord is blessing the church. Humility is important. So God forbid we would ever stand here or here or, or in a life group or any other meeting and we're boasting about our greatness. It's like, we're going to boast about the greatness of Jesus. So may we, may we hide ourselves, our giftings and our talents behind the cross so people can see Jesus and, and not us. Because if people see Jesus, that means they're, they're, they're seeing the one who died for their sins. They're seeing the one who can redeem them and renew them and restore them. If they see us, it's, it's, it's nothing, right? It, it's just temporal. So may people see Jesus, and, and may you and I spend some quiet time this week and just, just maybe even, even read the, the crucifixion account, just that, we would, just that we would know, Jesus died for someone like me. I want to spend my, spend my life uh, following, uh, following him. Can we pray? Jesus, you are well aware of our issues. You're well aware of our insecurities that we, we find our identity in things like our jobs. We find our identity in things. So when someone pushes against what we find our identity in, we, we feel bare Jesus, we pray that you would help us to be slave of all. Because in doing so, we are following you rightly. That we don't have to always be first and tops and top, but we we can simply follow you, follow your example. And if you, God of very God, can 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 wipe and wash feet, who are we who are not God? Help us to serve one another. Help us just to serve one another out out of a pure heart. Jesus, forgive us for being so, uh, uh, so upset when we are treated less than. You were treated much worse. So I guess what I'm saying, Jesus, is we just want to follow you. Help us to, to remember what you endured for us, that you set us free. Help us this week, Jesus, to to follow in these footsteps. Help us, Jesus, to to not forget that you 
rose from the dead, that you're alive today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, that you're alive. Praise you, Jesus, that our hope is alive today. And one day you're going to come back for us. Hey, if you're here with us or you're online and Jesus is not your savior, that he's not uh, the Lord of your life, if uh, he's not the Lord and you are his slave, then we want to pray that you would begin to follow Jesus as the Lord of your life, that you would follow him as, as a servant, as, as a doulos, as slave. And if that's what you want, you want Jesus to forgive you, you want joy and peace. You, you, you want Jesus to walk with you through this thing called life. There's just a simple prayer that you and I can pray. And the prayer is this, Father in heaven, forgive me a sinner. Jesus, I believe you died on a cross that you've taken my sins upon yourself and you rose again the third day. Oh, Jesus, I, I want to follow you as my savior. Give me the power to live for you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. And if you said that prayer online, there's a little link that you can click that says, I just gave my life to Jesus. We'd love to get in contact with you. And if you said that prayer and you're here in the sanctuary, I'd love to meet you. I'll be outside. I just want to encourage you. Jesus, my brothers and sisters that know you, bless the journey. Keep the lessons coming. And may we continually remember that you have risen from the dead and that you are making intercession for your church. And the church said, amen, amen and amen.